This session is presented in English with subtitles available in English and French. To toggle the subtitles, please use the menu at the bottom of the video. Our work takes place on traditional indigenous territories across the province. We acknowledge that there are 46 treaties and other agreements that cover the territory that we now call Ontario. We are thankful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to contribute to the strength of Ontario and to all communities across the province and Canada. Welcome everyone. Happy World IP Day. My name is Claudia Kriviak and I am the CEO of the Ontario Centre of Innovation. I will ask each panelist to introduce themselves and include the, the role that they hold in their respective organizations and how they became responsible for the IP strategy in their company. So first, I will ask Rekha. Hi, my name is Rekha Sharma and I'm an electrical power system engineer with 15 years of experience in the industry. Uh, currently, I'm uh, holding the role of CEO of Solforex. It's an AI-powered electric vehicle charging platform, which uh, makes sure that the scope two emissions are minimized. Being a technical founder, I was the primary person to do the research. And that's that just was called upon me that I also do the, do the strategy, which I knew a few things beforehand. And I also learned a hell lot with IAC. So thank you for all your contribution, IAC. Thank you, Rekha. Sabrina? Hi, my name is Sabrina Fiorlino. I'm the CEO of Faro. Um, my pre in my previous life, I was a lawyer, still am a lawyer, but don't practice anymore. Uh, I did several years of mergers and acquisitions, public private partnership, and IP. Uh, have founded several companies and had successful exits. Uh, and with this company, uh, while we do modular manufacturing, specializing in healthcare, uh, IP is not top of mind for most. It was top of mind for me, given my IP background. And that's how I came to be uh, in charge of the IP strategy for the company. Thank you, Sabrina. Joanna? Okay, so my name is Joanna Ng. Um, I have 49 patents granted in my name. Uh, before I left IBM, I was the IBM's master inventor. Uh, I was in the uh, IBM patent review board for two technology areas. And I had held a seven-year tenure as the head of research at IBM Canada Center for Advanced Studies. I also co-authored two computer science books, The Smart Internet and The Personal Web, uh, with 20-something uh, peer review um, paper. I became an inventor by accident instead of by aspiration. I was forced to file a patent because my boss stopped shipping my product. So fear that our competitor might sue us for those features, even though they came after us. So I was really upset. So I filed a set of patents, kicking and screaming. And there were, it turned out, eight patents filed in the first uh, IBM mobile commerce platform that I almost walked away from. So now I continue um, in my own startup, focusing on artificial intelligence and augmented um intelligence, uh, protecting IP become my company's strategy. Thank, thank you, Joanna. So to begin our discussion, um, let's talk about some of the challenges that women in the IP system face. And, and let's kind of just get a, a sense of what the current state is. So if we look at data um, coming out of the U.S., um, the share of patents with at least one woman inventor grew from 20.7% to 21.9%. Um, between 2016 and, and, and 2019. And, and that improvement is, is too slight when compared to other benchmarks with respect to women's education and women's employment specifically in STEM. And then if we actually look at um, the proportion of patents um, or the share of patents among all inventor patentees that, that are women, the number is only 12.8%. So um, Joanna, why don't I start with you? You have 49 um, patents. That is incredibly um, um, impressive. Why is the number of patents, um, uh, why is the percentage of women inventors and patentees so low? 
Oh, okay. So the percentage of women in STEM professionals are low to start off with, right? So uh, while gender generalization was never wise, I do have the following observation from working with professional STEM women throughout my career. Uh, in general, um, and most women take joy in solving problems, in making a difference in real people's life and not as much interested in claiming the territories uh, as our own, especially in the intellectual property. So if we use, you know, being the first to land on the moon as an analogy, the first woman landed would be rejoicing. And the first thing they would do is high-fiving everyone in the team. While most men, the first thing they would do is to put the flag on the moon before they utter a word. Um, so, you know, with the small percentage of women inventor from the small percentage of uh, a professional women in STEM, we do suffer an imposter syndrome as an inventor. I had problem calling myself as an inventor even after more than eight patents were granted to my name. But whereas I observed my male colleague, they boldly call themselves an inventor while they barely file a patent at the patent's office without any grant. So there is an imposter syndrome here. Then we also struggle with integrating the woman identity with our identity as an inventor in the tech world. I remember in one of the IBM Corporate Technical Achievement Award ceremony, that allowed us to bring spouses. I did my medicure for the first time to celebrate the occasion. And my husband, who is also um, someone who is a male in the tech world himself, out of his concern and say, are you sure? Like, would your male colleague take your technical image seriously? I was stunned. I know he had a point. But I also refuse to compromise my identity as a woman in order to excel in the tech world. Thank, thank you for those for those um, for those insights. I, I think in terms of um, in, imposter imposter syndrome, that, that that is something that a lot of women, including a lot of very accomplished women, have had um, experience with. And so, um, Rekha, how how can we address some of these these challenges? What can we do to start fixing some of this? Um, I think. There has to be two approaches. One is ground up and then the people who are in the positions, nurturing them and then giving them the confidence. Exactly. You know what we just heard from Joanna that, you know, it's just the imposter syndrome. But then what I would suggest, another point is just doing ground up. I'm an engineer. I did my master's. How many other female were there who were doing that? So it's just inculcating that behavior from beginning you know when the girls are in the high school that it's just there it's it's just a possibility i myself had a limitation that when i'm going to take my job will i be in the construction all the time in that mud and then you know getting into the coal mine myself or i will just take a desk job which may or may not be challenging it's my parents they said why do you care if they're just 13 guys and you're the only girl so i have to give credit to the kind of you know like values they put in me in early on and uh, that's one way we can have have more of us out there, not just three, maybe 30, and then eventually 300 and 3000s, getting the ratio balanced, uh, which is like right now very skewed. So absolutely, representation really does, that does matter. It is important that women um, um, who are looking at potential um, careers in the IP um, sector, women who are in, in tech roles, women who are aspiring to tech, see other people that look like themselves in those roles. That is that is really important and, and helps address some of those um, issues. But some of the challenges are also much more systemic. Um, and from the perspective of if we look at the, the data um, as well, and we look at funding and VC funding specifically, because when we're talking about IP, what we're talking about is commercialization of that I, IP. And in order to be able to commercialize a technology and take it to, to the market, you, you need um, VC funding. And in terms of the data on um, VC funding, women receive less than 2% of VC um, funding. And this number is actually decreasing. Um, Sabrina, um, can you comment um, on, 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 the, on the challenges from, from that perspective? 
Absolutely. So I think funding is intricately connected to filing IP. It can be very expensive to file IP. And so if you don't have funding and you're choosing between customer sales or customer retention or marketing for the product and filing patent, you might choose revenue generation over uh, IP filings. And so, uh, and Claudia, you're right. We're, I think, at 1.6% of uh Oh, uh, females in funding, venture funding, 1.6% of all venture funding goes to females or solely female uh, owned companies, led and owned. And that's numbers, I think the lowest since it's been since 2016. And so we are going down, we are over 2% last year, and that doesn't help uh, at all. There's lots of things you can do to push out costs related to patents, for example, file provisionals, delay PCTs, etc., cetera, uh, in order to prolong funding. But if there's no funding to begin with or very little, I think it inhibits women from filing um, and, and then I wanted to go back to a point that everyone talks about, which is imposter syndrome. I look at what I did with my company and uh, we filed patents. I was intimately involved in the inventions that were that we filed for. And I decided not to put my name down as an inventor. And at the time, it seemed insignificant. And I thought, OK, it's just complicated, multi-inventors. We need all these assignments. Forget it. Uh, in retrospect, I look at the numbers and I think it was a mistake. I should have been there. We would have helped with the statistics, but it's meaningful. And I think what Reiko was saying, if they don't see you, if people don't see you, then they don't believe they can achieve it either. And so uh, now in retrospect, going forward, I will change my thought process on that. And I, so the word kind of representation has come up um, um, a number, um, a number of times with respect to um, uh, VC funding. It, it's interesting because the majority of VCs are, are in fact met. And so from that regard, it's not surprising um, that the number of, of deals is, is low um, with respect to funding from VCs going, going, to, um, going to women. But the catch-22 is where do VCs and angel investors typically come from? Well, they're successful serial entrepreneurs that have um, exited, that are wealthy, and they're looking to invest more of their money. So until we get more women, um, um, successfully commercializing their IP, becoming successful entrepreneurs, and then transitioning to becoming investors them, um, themselves. I think we, 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 have, a, um, we have a challenge. And, and so um, going back to your point, Sabrina, on, 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 on representation, um, repre representation matters at, at all levels. And thank you for, for, for sharing your um, story, because in terms of sharing your story about um, you know, being in a position where you could actually put your being in a very in a leadership position where you could actually take uh, put your name on those patents. You chose not to demonstrate that um, this whole notion of an imposter sy uh, syndrome cuts at all levels of leadership and mentor and um, representation matters at all levels of, of, of leadership. So I want to kind of take the discussion on the need for role models and some of the things that we as leaders, as women leaders can do, whether it's in terms of mentorship or whether it is in terms of um, sponsorship um, or whether it is um, um, in, in other ways. What are some of the things that that we can we can do? Maybe Joanna? So um, representation breeds identification. We can never become who we cannot imagine ourselves to be. Uh, and that has more power than we realize. I remember in multiple of the IBM corporate events to promote patents and innovation, often the poster child is a white male that looked like a crazy scientist in the movie Back in the Future. While I compare my CV with the, 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 you know, the icon, I think it's comparable, but I felt so invalidated. I could never be that person, I thought to myself. Because the best I could do is to wear the one old jeans and the fussy hair, but I could never grow those beards. So to have the promotion that the image, the, our mental image of a scientist needs to be changed within ourselves and across society. And that is power because we cannot be someone who we couldn't even imagine ourselves to be. So we really need role model of male, uh, female inventors and say, hey, uh, inventors and scientists can do their pedicure and mendicure. Why not? Right. <laughs> As an alternative. Uh, 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 absolutely. Uh, you know, 
we can't be complacent. Um, even as 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 leaders and in the positions that 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 we are, um, because um, we're often asked to to sit and speak on on panels, for for example, um, and we're busy with 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 other things. But there are young women who are developing, starting their careers right now, or even and younger and contemplating where they want to take their careers. And it is important that, you know, they see people, as you say, Joanna, that, that kind of look like them, that look like us in these, um, in these, in these positions. Um, um, Rekha, can you talk a little bit about from, from your, from your perspective, um, what can we do um, to, to help the next generation of, of women in IP um, with, with their um, connections, with the relationships that they need to that they need to build to help them progress in their in their careers and to actually give consideration to a career in 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 IT. Uh, I think one thing I would like to point out is uh, just the information. As Joanna said, that you know they should have they should be able to imagine themselves to look like that. So just to have the panels like we are in right now. It, you know, if a young girl somewhere sees it, they they see that there are some you know like Joanna has forty nine. 49 patterns. So it's possible. So just something is possible, make the other person believe and probably next generation will, you know, take next steps. So I would say mix of mentoring, just the information, having a talk about it. And most importantly, when, you know, the sponsoring, uh, I don't want don't want to discount this fact that the funding you know it 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 dries up very fast and uh, you know when we we understand that the patent any any kind of IP it will come with a cost and we have to empower our young generation with that with that. I would say is that the financials are taken care, just the innovation part is what they have to do. So it can be in any which field, but if this female is innovative, uh, then uh, then the funding will be taken care of. So uh, a little bit, I would say mix of every angle, not just one will probably create a fruitful result. And I can have an anecdote in my own person. I always reflect back when I, by accident got you know inspired i i was born in india and so was indra nui so when she became a pepsico ceo who was an immigrant in this country and became so big it was very big and i was in school i didn't know who she is i just knew that this is a brown girl who looks like me and she's done amazing and that's all i knew and i remember telling this to my dad i want to be like her and then he told me that you know you have to see what steps she has done a lot of hard works and i as a child it's always a a starry moment so i know what the path is but then that then my mentor showed me what are the steps and they gave me the funding and then they gave me the hard work that has to be nowhere i'm close to her but at least i can dream I can dream seeing a role model for me when I was just in school. So I wish that there are more and more like her and like us. Uh, and someone is around listening in school and get inspired, just how I got inspired. So, you know, what the panel is pointing out is that representation is, is really, really important and, and, and it matters. Um, I, and, and, and it is. Um, but I was also want to kind of Ask the panelists, and, and maybe Sabrina, I'll start with you. What can we, as leaders, because because we, the panelists on 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 this um, on this panel, um, women in significant leadership positions, women with significant power, women that write checks to vendors and and clients um, um, all the time, women that sponsor individuals um, all the time for 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 new roles and 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 and, and opportunities. Um, what can we do um, that that is tangible to help um, address the problems um, um, of women in in the tech sector, of of women scientists, women inventors, um, um, to ultimately help them succeed? So, Sabrina, I'll start with. You. Sure. Thanks, Claudia. So I I think a few things uh, we talked a little bit about mentorship versus sponsorship, uh, and actually promoting other women inventors, other women in IP. I think that's extremely important versus just mentoring them. Uh, But recently I was at a women's networking event and um, the chair of the event was a female lawyer in IP. And she said something that never dawned on me before, which was 
please refer work to women, refer work to women providers, women insurers, women lawyers, et cetera. And I reflected on that and realized almost all of our service providers were men. And I had the ability to change that. Um, and while our management team is majority female and while we're majority female owned and our board is four of seven females, our providers didn't reflect that. And so it's something that I could easily change. Um, so I think that's really important to do. Uh, you know, think of other women who you can promote, uh, who you can uh, help along their careers. And then I think the other thing is being visible, doing things like this, talking about it, uh, having other women see, uh, like Rega said, and Joanne, if they can see you, they can do it. So, so me and my CFO are both females. We talk about taking the company public one day. Uh, when we do, we may be the first female CEO and CFO who've ever taken their company manufacturing business comp public in Canada, which is shocking in 2023. But uh, we want to do that because we want to promote women in STEM, and we want to be have you know other women in STEM look at us and say it is possible. So I want to want to pick up on on a couple of of, of, of points. Um, you know your your point about um, you have women in leadership positions in your company, uh, but the vendors that you have at at one point in time didn't actually di reflect that um, that 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 diversity, and you were in a position to change that. I, I think that that is really really powerful. And, and earlier on um, on in my career, I had a similar experience where um, um, I was sitting on a on a board, and the board was looking at hiring um, some advisors in the financial sector. And um, we were interviewing and, and the, um, there were, the board was majority, but the people on the board were women. And of course, the, the, the advisors we were, in, we were interviewing were all men. And one of the more senior women um, um, had, had said, well, we'll just ask them to have women there. And I'm like, we can't ask them. She said, we can ask them for whatever we want because we're signing the check and they're going to accommodate us. And so I think that that is something that is that is quite powerful. Um, you 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 also said you know shocking right. I want to shift the discussion a little bit to to, to IP and, and 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 more. And so in terms of um, the stats around the number of on, on the on the service provider side in 2022, less than 22 percent of patent attorneys and agents were women, and only 1.7 percent were actually diverse. Women. And so. Just to put that 1.7% into, into context, um, that means there are more patent professionals named Mike than there are diverse women in, in the sector. And that to me is, is actually quite, um, quite, 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 quite shocking. Um, but I, I want to shift the, 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 the discussion to, um, to, to, to IP and specifically to using IP as a way of fostering innovation. Um, most people, when they think of IP, they think of oh, protection and lawyers, and they don't necessarily think of IP um, and, and innovation. And so this is a question I would like to ask each, each, each of the past. Um, from your experience, how can um, a company use IP effectively as a way of driving? So Joanne, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, um, in so I mean um, uh, artificial intelligence and software technology, the fight is real in that if you do not protect your IP, if other people who come later than you uh, could sue you back. And so so the, the competition is real, the protection required is needed. But not only that, I think in terms of speaking to women, when you... Uh, uh, augment the discussion in line with how women think. Uh, and if you make it not about her, it seems to be a lot more enabling. So for example, like if we shift it to say, if you really wanted to take your innovation to create a better world, to change people's life for the better, uh, then you need to make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hand. And that immediately motivates a lot more women to, uh, to uh, file the patent because they want to be enabling to complete the vision of making a better world, bettering people's life. Uh, and, the, and also the reality is that if you don't have that right, 
there is a very big limit in your commercialization. So uh, I think making that clear is good. Uh, is important, necessary, but spinning it to, it's not about me. Like somehow, yes, women put, uh, okay, so I'm not going to generalize. So I, I promise myself that, but but it te- um, most women tend to think of ourselves less. So once we turn around and say, no, 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 it's not about you. If you really want to complete the mission of making the world a better place to better more people's life, you need this. So that you can finish what you set out to do. And then I think that would motivate a lot more women in venture. But, but thank you, Joanna. So, Rekha, how do we help um, more women make the connection between IP and innovation? That IP is actually synonymous with successful commercialization of a new technology. Yeah, so there can be two eyes to it, like one as a bigger corporation where they have multiple patents and they are like grown like, you know, humongous and like, you know, apples and the, the Samsung wars. Let me go zoom in to my world, which is a startup. And for a startup, there is a lot of uncertainties and having an IP is a proof of that tech, that it is innovative, that also makes the company, the whole like, you know, the innovation investable. That's your moat. Moat is like you are kind of creating an IP that protects you against your incumbents. Uh, It's also a survival, I would say, uh, moat that most of the investors will take your innovation, I would say, seriously, because there there is an IP in it. Because just my first hand. I am, I have done something and it's just, you don't expect your innovation to be so simple. Otherwise it won't be innovation, right? Uh, So simple that anyone would be able to appreciate in 10 or 15 minutes, which is that we have to give. So this is a sign that it's in, it's actually a step ahead in technology and whatever we are doing. So I would say for startups, having an IP is is a very clear, I would say, a validation point that we have to build in early on and it'll help going further, uh, making your credibility really high. Thank you. Thank you, Rekha. Um, so, so Sabrina, you, you bring an interesting perspective to this because as an entrepreneur, um, you know that IP leads to R&D and R&D leads to new product development and new product development leads to, to um, sales um, and, 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 and profit. But you were also a lawyer um, at one point, and I'm sure you spoke to many startups um, about, about IP. So can you comment on um, some of the things that you may have heard from companies um, in terms of why, we're, why they were putting off um, um, either an IP strategy or IP protection and, and, and maybe address those. Cause I think you could bring a really interesting perspective being, having been on both sides. Yeah, for sure. So, so for me, because of my background, uh, IP and innovation have always been synonymous. So unique innovation leads to IP. And so they've always meant almost the same thing for me, uh, but not everybody thinks that way. And so for me, it's always about educating uh, in order for people to understand the importance of it. So you're right. I, I had clients who often put off IP and I would say a lot of it was driven by costs. Uh, and I had mentioned earlier, if you don't get funding, uh, very hard to commit to a robust IP strategy. But we would always walk through things on how to push out costs related to the IP strategy, file provisionals, push out PCT phases, et cetera, not necessarily have to respond to examiners at the provisional phase. So all of these things to to be able to push out costs. Um, And then I go back to funding again in order to create an environment in a company where innovation flourishes, you need R&D budgets. You need to be able to say to people, we have R&D budgets. We want you to innovate. So at our company, for me, I always say we're either disrupting the existing technology or we're dying. And so let's disrupt and continue to innovate and continue to promote innovation from within. But that that also requires me to commit to a large enough R&D budget that I enable 
everyone who's on the R&D side of the company to be able to continue to invent and then speak to them about why the inventions are important, why filing IP around the inventions uh, inventions are important, and why that helps us maintain a competitive advantage in what we're doing. Even in manufacturing, people might think of modular manufacturing and think, oh, why are you going to invent in modular? What are you going to invent in modular manufacturing? Why is IP important there? They almost, um, I think a lot of people would connect it to construction. Now, there's no IP in construction. But for me, there always has been and always will be. It's just changing the mentality within uh, the sector in order to push the boundary. No, I, 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 absolutely. I, I think that a, a common theme is, and everyone is, I like to use this expression, in violent agreement that. Um, an IP strategy is critical when you're talking about commercialization. Um, but Sabrina, you mentioned costs as being one of the, the potential um, um, barriers. And, and I feel like at, at this point, you know, um, it's important to, to, to note that there are resources out there to assist um, entrepreneurs um, um, that are commercialized. Um, new technologies and specifically assistance around, around IP and IP strategy. So a shout out to, to, to IAC, everyone in the audience. I, I really encourage you um, to, there is um, some information in the, in the webinar chat. IAC provides tremendous support services um, to, 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 their, to their membership and to companies around IP, um, IP strategy. Um, more generally in, in Ontario, there is IP Ontario that also provides um, um, services. Um, as well. Um, but maybe um, the panelists could also speak a little bit to um, um, those in the audience that may be wondering, okay, I, I, I get it. IP is really, really important. Um, as, as a woman, um, doubly more so um, important because of the added barriers that, that women um, face um, when trying to successfully commercialize their, um, their, their IP. What advice um, would, you, would, you, would you give um, would you give them in terms of the supports that are available or just advice to, to women that are, that, are, that are entrepreneurs and are looking to commercialize um, IP? Joanna? Um, I think having a woman network is important uh, so that you have a go-to people to ask um, their different experiences. And uh, you can even find um, uh, lawyers who you can do some assessment before it turned into a client-lawyer relationship. Uh, and that's where you find um, real-life experiences from other women that are relatable, that are in similar situations, that are in startup, that even if you're so understanding the critical nature of filing that IP, every startup strapped for fun, uh, and where to get those resources, um, and seeing other people has done that, like uh, ourselves, would greatly help for sure. Thank, th thanks, thanks, jo Joanna. That that that's that's great. That's great advice, Reka. I would say I would resonate. You know what has been discussed. I can share a little bit from you know how I I knew what patent is. I know what innovation is. But then when you're just starting a company, there are so many things, and you don't know which which one to prioritize. Of course, funding is a struggle. If I just have hundred k, then should it go in the products, which can actually lead to more revenue, or I just protect this? So this this battle is always there, and these are the tools that I used. Uh, I did an IP 101 course myself from UFT, just telling me everything about it. So that laid the 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 base. I uh, our startup is also in some incubators that we get mentors, and one of my mentors was a female and a lawyer, and she advised uh, me a lot in the in this space. So a lot of mentorship, a lot of assessment was done just, you know, as in kind contribution to the company. And then IAC, there are a lot of, it's not only financial help, it's also these 101 courses and then these basic just the landscaping, uh, you know, reports that they come out every six months that, you know, they, they identify what stream you're in, what's your area of innovative. And they gave those reports. They are very well, I would say, uh, researched. And that saves a lot of time. And that is a fuel that you can actually use to just do your business side also. Because uh, as a business, you have to have a product which lures a 
person and he pays something, right? So that's the basic of a business. But there are a lot of bits and pieces that I used. Uh, and I'm not saying that I know everything, but that's available. That's available without, you know, spending a lot, a lot right now. So having information first is a very key. And then taking decisions based on your your groundwork is I would say any anyone you know in my situation where they're trying to build a company based on IP mode uh, you know they can probably talk to me afterwards and I can tell them. Awesome thank you Rika. So S- Sabrina what what advice would you give to to women that are successfully commercialized? So I, I would say one don't be afraid to ask for help. I think this is something that I faced my entire career always. Oh, I don't want to ask because I'm already starting from a disadvantaged position is going to make me look weak or worse and I think that's a mistake and so now I freely ask for help when I need it uh and advice. Uh, and I would say there's also a ton of government programs and funding in Claudia you mentioned some Rika mentioned some Joanna mentioned some but even stuff like shred um, for R and D credits, and um, and there's a ton of government programs. I, I look back at some of the things we did when the company was just at its infancy, uh, whether it was through the Toronto Board of Trade or Synapse in Hamilton or other organizations where um, there's competitions where you can win money. There's mentorship. Um, there's courses. So there, there's just a ton of stuff available for free in the early stages that I would encourage uh, inventors to take advantage of. Awesome. Um, very great advice. I think just in, in, in general, like don't be afraid to ask for, 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 for help. Absolutely. Um, so why don't we take a few questions from, 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 from the audience? Um, and why don't we start with, with this one? Because we, we have been talking about what what women, what women in leadership positions can do to 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 enable um, women in this sector. But the, the first question from um, the audience is, what can men in non-leadership positions do to champion um, women's inclusion and involvement in the IP sector? Um, would anyone like to take that question? I, I, I can take this because I work mostly with men to such an extent that in a worldwide conference call, I did not need to introduce myself because I was the only female. <laughs> That's not good, right? So um, I think peer men can do a lot in enabling women. Uh, so I would say this, uh, none of the discriminatory behavior were ever intentional or have any bad intent or have any ill uh, motivation. I absolutely can say that. However, uh, I do uh, sometimes uh, in the rare occasions do experience um, some hostility in the invention space um, when um, when um, the invention area uh, turned out to be uh, the acclaimed specialty of some of the men that there was a little hurt on how could you think of that and that was my space kind of a thing and that triggered some behavior that really shocked women so that happened to me once and um so i remember i was uh, proposing a uh, pattern to be filed in one of the review board and the pattern area is in cybersecurity which a lot of the, um, there was like very heavily uh, invested area. So there was a lot of male claim to be the guru of cybersecurity. So I just innocently present this idea and all the male hey my guts <laughs> as if I've touched something that belongs to them. And, and but, but what was shocking was that these were my friends, like outside of this discussion of patterns, these are people I trust like these, these are my colleagues that we fought battles with that one customer together. And so that's why I could say that none of them were intentional uh, uh, to, to, to that extent. So I think being aware of that misfit that woman inventor introduced and take a stop and count to 10 without saying a word and orientate your mental um, uh, a map to accommodate this 
is good. Uh, it, it takes education, it takes practice. Um, and so that is the entry. But on the uh, more positive side, uh, to more to be more um, uh, proactive in inviting uh, a female colleague into the jam session instead of only having it in the male washroom. <laughs> Which did happen to me once. Like we were discussing something and all the mail went to the washroom. And it's like, I can't participate, guys. <laughs> so so like to be more inclusive, you know, from the choice of environment, like because not all women discuss technical things at the bar on a napkin, right? Like so those little things to be more intentional, to be inclusive is an, another like layer to be more inclusive for women inventors. Um, Sabrina Reka, do you have any any so, so, Reka? Uh, first of all, it has happened to me also, Joanne. So you really... <laughs> I think it's happened to all of us. That's why we're all uh, about. So another thing I want to say is they might be doing it unintentionally, but just being being too nice. Uh, I have worked till the ninth month. I have two kids, and I worked till the ninth month that I was pregnant, and there was no complication in my pregnancy, and there was just no need that I needed to take rest. And I love my work, and I was working. It's just that you know my counterparts like they were like very caring that you know she should not be doing that and I felt that just because like I am this kind of person who's like no I, like the minute you say no I'm gonna do that uh, I don't know if it's happening that the females are left out from the opportunity not because people think that they are less but they're just caring but uh just that bias which comes in that they don't get the opportunity if a big project is getting getting live at the midnight or she has to come in the midnight let her say no if she cannot come she'll say no but if she wants to come don't be too nice and take take this opportunity away from her and then the second thing is, which is, which has come in recently because there is so much talk about the inclusivity and, you know, diversity and like, you know, we should encourage the female. Sometimes when you just don't discount the hard work that the female, done. if she is the chosen one for something, if you're, if you're a colleague and you, you're left out, of course, it's a, you will feel bad. It's human nature, but just don't just say, oh, because you're a female, you it has happened to me and it's very heartbreaking because I I feel that when I'm good, it's it should be said because I was good, I got that. So it could be just you're you're a pal and you're feeling bad. Just uh just accept it. It's okay, right? Like uh so those were the two things from my personal experience. I want want to say it happened and uh, I didn't feel good about it. I, I think those are really important points because you know the 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 advice is um Treat and respect your women colleagues as competent individuals. Um, respect that competence. Um, and also allow women to make decisions for themselves. And it's it, that's basically what you're what what, what you're saying, um, Reka. And 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 that's something that that many men just naturally afford to their male colleagues in the in in in, in the first place. So women are not asking for for um, anything that um, a natural expectation. Um, Sabrina, did, did you have something you, you wanted to, to say before we go to the to the next question from the audience? Sure, sure. I, I wanted to circle back to the theme of mentorship versus sponsorship. And, and I think even peer to peer. So the question was, what can you do for your peers, even if you're not in, in a position of leadership? So even peer to peer, you can sponsor, you can promote your female colleagues, you can encourage your female colleagues, you can have uh, open dialogue with your female colleagues that encourage Encourages them uh, to do better or to, to work as hard as they want to, as we discussed. And so uh, I look at our leadership team. I said we're a majority female, but obviously we have males on our leadership team also. And we're always encouraging of each other and always promotional of each other. And I think that's really, really important to foster innovation, to foster growth. Absolutely. Um, second question from, from the audience. Um, to the panelists, how do you hope your industry is going to change in the coming year? Who wants to be first to take it? I can take it. I, I, uh, so for me, I think um, it's been slow growth and sometimes uh, backwards growth. So we talk, I, I circle back to funding. Funding's gone down for females in the VC world, not up. Uh, and so what I would like to see is 
accelerated growth in terms of change. So accelerated change uh, in STEM or, you know, in, in women in leadership roles in general, uh, I think you know, you see accelerated growth in technology, accelerated growth in, in different industries, but not as it relates to female leaders, women in STEM, et cetera. And so I think the more of us that are out there, the more promoting we're doing, the more visible we are, the faster we can accelerate that change. Joanne, what are your hopes for your industry in terms of the change in the coming years? Hmm. Um, there was a period of time where I was the only female, I wasn't aware of it because they make me not aware of it. And, and then I realized, wow, that's what was like if it works. Um, so um, I, I wish that uh, very soon there will be a, 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 a period uh, that we can enter into an era where there are inventors, not female inventors. There are entrepreneurs, not female entrepreneurs. And there are even distribution that are well represented to the normal, uh, to the distribution uh, diversity of the population in all sectors of the industry. That's when we know it works. That not just the representation, but also people now get into focus on solving the problem, making technology breakthrough and advance it without realizing that we are from different gender. I think that would be the, that's when we know it works. And then, Reka, what, what do you hope your industry or how do you hope your industry will change? Um, I think I have, I, I often repeat this when I get my engineering degree, I get an engineer degree. I don't get a female engineering degree. And I feel so bad when they say I'm a female, female founder. I'm a founder. I, I like to innovate and I do this. So I definitely resonate that I don't want this bias to just put it on my head, assess me if I'm good or not. Don't look at my face. Uh, other than that, I think what I would want to say is just the, uh, just this feel good factor that, you know, people give, and I don't know how to like, you know, properly articulate, oh, you're an inventor. Oh, do you have kids? Wow. That should not be the wow factor. It should be the wow factor what I actually create. Right. So that's what I'm, I'm striving for. I have put in my blinders on. I don't think myself like when I'm working, I'm working. I don't think myself that I'm a female working, but I, I wish that people also value and applaud me for the work I do rather than just because I'm a female, I'm trying. So that's that's my vision. So echo. Judge up for the quality of our work. Yeah. A a a a a a absolutely. And um I, I think that resonates with, with everyone on um on, on on this panel. And for me, my my hope for, for, for my industry is that, you know, um um, there will there will come a time very, very soon where I sit on fewer of these panels where we talked about how do we help women overcome these um, these barriers um, in, in in general. And now as we're coming up to time, I think just one one final question. So we talked about a lot of the barriers, a lot of the challenges, and a lot of the things that um, that that we can that we can do. Um, and and one of the things that came out in in, in that discussion is how challenging it actually it actually is. Um, whether they're the, the challenges are internal challenges or external systemic challenges, like in terms of uh, representation of women and also funding, um, VC funding, et cetera. So how do each of you keep yourselves motivated and, and productive when you're feeling um, um, burned out and, and, and in this environment? Because I, I, I do want to end this on a on a um, um, on a on a on a on a on a kind of a positive note, because all of you are highly accomplished and highly and highly successful. So maybe Reka? I would say having a good, you know, life balance always avoids having burnouts. I I always have a time that I take with my family so I don't go insane. Having good support system, even when you're working, your team should be such that you might feel low at that time, but then they motivate you. So make a good team in the workspace of the workspace and believe me kids are very <laughs> good distractors uh, I always make sure I did that very bad when I started my business like I I used to always say okay whatever comes my way I eat eat junk food miss out on all the the healthy you know on your walks and your this 
Now I'm like, no, my 30 minutes and my 30 minutes, I have to make sure that my health is good. And if that's good, the burnouts won't happen. That's what I'm doing. Very good. That's, that's very good um, advice. Sabrina, how do you uh, manage the, 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 the stress and not burning out? Yeah, so, so I think it, it changes over time. I think, Claudia, me and you have had this discussion before. I think uh, I talked to myself about work-life balance at different ages and stages in life. And, you know, un- you have to understand the stage of the company. So the company's in a growth stage. There's not a ton of balance. There's a lot of imbalance. And you have to be okay with that. And, and as long as you're okay with that, I, I think that's okay. And, uh, you know, w- w- decide on whether or not that's okay in different ages and stages uh, of your life. I would say for me, I was born with the attitude that failure is not an option. And so it's been somewhat easy for me to keep going even in very difficult times. But I've also had a very good support network right now. You know, our team uh, really supports each other and picks each other up if if things go wrong. Uh, and And I do... Uh, ensure that I make time for myself. I pre-make my meal plans. I do my exercise every day. Uh, and if I have to do it at 5 a.m., that's fine. I have to do it at midnight. It's fine. But I get it in uh, no matter what. And, and I feel that that helps with resilience. Mm-hmm. Joanna, how do you keep yourself motivated and productive when you're feeling burnt out? I feel the battle is in your mind and in your heart. If you lose your battle inside, you lose the battle. Uh, and so to win the battle, uh, we need to never lose sight of our why. Um, so if I need to take a break, it is for the why, because it can't be done with such a short time. I'm here in the long haul. If I need to take a vacation, if I need to see my kid, it's because of the why, because I don't want to be an example where I have the success, but everyone in my family hate me. Uh, so never lose sight of your why, uh, which is the picture of the of the future you want to create and the role model you want to be left behind uh, so that. I want to be that person. I I want to be that person. And therefore, I need to eat healthy. I need to go for, you know, 20 laps swim three times a week uh, because I know I can't get it done in six months, just cranking up 18 hours a week. Uh, and if I live that way, I would become someone whom I wouldn't want to become. And then the why is not achieved. So that's like having the inner battle victory to never lose your why is kind of my way of keeping myself going. Um, that, 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 that's powerful insight, um, um, Joanna. I, and I think that's powerful insight to, to all entrepreneurs, um, not just um, women entrepreneurs, not to lose sight of the why. All entrepreneurs are, are what they're doing is they're trying to build and they're trying to solve some of the, 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 the greatest challenges that, that um, are, are facing us today and, and, and not to lose sight of the why because that actually keeps you grounded. Um, so that brings us to, to, to the end of the, um, the session. I would like to thank all of the pa- panelists for your time and your insight and also your candor and your willingness um, to, to share. Um, um, thank you for the, for the great the great discussion and, and thank you to IAC for hosting us today on this session.